Hi, my name is Philip. Uh, I'm a former PhD student from the Seismic Laboratory for Imaging and Modeling at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, and in this talk, I'll present a framework that we wrote for invertible neural networks in, Ju in the Julia language uh, that takes advantage of the invertibility of networks um, and provides a memory efficient implementation for training uh, of very large scale examples. Um, this work was done while I was at the Georgia Institute of Technology in collaboration uh, with several colleagues from their group and with uh, Boss Peters, who's uh, at Emory University at the time. Invertible neural networks are a class of uh, networks that have become very popular over recent time, especially in the context of generative mod modeling via normalizing flows. Um, and invertible neural networks, along with um, generative adversarial networks and variational autoencoders, uh, are one of the main the best networks uh, for generative modeling. So one of the papers, for example, using the, the GLOW network uh, produces these very high resolution images that are sampled from um, basically random Gaussian distribution. Apart from generative modeling, there are also other applications of invertible neural networks um, that include, for example, uncertainty quantification for inverse problems, for example, in the context of seismic imaging. Apart from generative modeling and uncertainty quantification, invertible neural networks offer a very big other advantage, uh, which, as the name suggests, is obviously their invertibility. Um, so what that means is that you can actually recompute the output, um, sorry, the input from the output of your network, so you do not have to, in principle, track any variables. So what this looks like in a forward pass is we start from a variable x that uh, we want to encode, and that x is fed into a network, and then we compute uh, a hidden state variable, for example, this h. And then we have a second network layer um, that inputs this h and then outputs our final output y. So now for the inverse pass, since our network is invertible, which means that each individual layer uh, within the network is invertible by itself as well, uh, that means that we can recompute the original input only from the output. So we can feed our y back into this network compute the inverse of the last layer to recompute the hidden state, and then input the hidden state into the inverse of the first layer to recompute the original input. So the invertibility of these neural networks has the big advantage that for training, you in principle do not have to store any of the hidden states, making this a very memory efficient um, approach. So because uh, you can recompute all the hidden states just from the final output, you don't actually have to store it in the input because as you invert the network, you can recompute all the hidden states that are used for training. Uh, so in principle, you can have a neural network that is memory independent of its depth. Um, the only thing you do have to store are obviously the weights of the respective layers, but you don't have to, in principle, store the hidden states. So in principle, this should allow you to train actually very deep uh, networks or networks that work on 3D images or um, for example, video or very uh, high resolution data. The big challenge though of having a memory efficient implementation of uh, invertible neural networks is that it's not very easy to integrate and fully take advantage of this property when you wanna write invertible neural network frameworks on top of existing machine learning libraries. Um, first of all, in the Julia language, there does not seem to be any um, packages for invertible neural networks. Uh, there's, of course, the conventional machine learning libraries such as Flux and Knet. There's also a small packages specifically for bijections, which are in principle invertible layers, right? Um, but it's nothing specific for uh, convolutional neural networks um, in, the, in the context of invertible neural networks and normalizing flows. And then there are a range of Python packages such as Freya, MemCNN, and uh, PyTorch normalizing flows. And these packages are specific for uh, invertible neural networks and normalizing flows, but they do not all take uh, advantage of the invertibility. So for example, Freya only provides basically invertible neural network layers that could be evaluated in the forward and inverse direction, but during training, it doesn't take advantage of the invertibility because it uses the conventional PyTorch uh, backpropagation. Then there's a framework called MemCNN, which does take advantage of the invertibility to some extent, but not in the most optimal, 
optimal manner. Uh, and I will show in the next couple of slides what exactly I mean by that. And then there's um, additional papers uh, with code that also provide uh, some form of implementation of neural network of these neural network layers such as GLOW and IRIM. Um, but again, either these frameworks or the, this code examples do not take advantage of the invertibility at all or only in this uh, non-optimal way, which I'm going to go into next. So in the first step now, we will consider the conventional way of training an invertible neural network in which you do not take advantage of the invertibility at all. So that you train that just like a conventional neural network. So that uh, is basically like always, you have uh, your forward pass and during your forward pass, you track all the operations and variables. Um, so you feed your X into your network, you compute the first layer, then that gives you the hidden state variable, which is now tracked, which means uh, you store a copy of that for the later backward pass. Uh, and then you compute your second layer and then the output Y. Now, when you do the back propagation to train your network and recompute the sensitivity with respect to the input, uh, what you do, first of all, you compute your data residual, delta Y, and now you feed that back into the network uh, and in each layer compute the backward pass of the back propagation. And the back propagation takes as an input th this delta Y, but to compute the updates of weights of this respective layer, it also needs access to uh, the original H, um, which is accessed because it's tracked or stored in the forward pass. So this generic approach of training a neural invertible neural network is used in some uh, subset of the invertible neural network frameworks, while another subset uses a uh, what I call layer-wise automatic differentiation technique. Uh, so this looks as follows. So uh, in this layer-wise AD approach, you do not do any tracking in the forward pass. So you only evaluate your neural network uh, as always, but you turn off tracking, uh, so you do not store the hidden states and the activations. Now, when you do your backward pass, you not only input your uh, data residual, delta Y, but also your original output Y. Uh, and what you do, you go layer by layer, and in each layer, first, you recompute the original input from the output, so you uh, evaluate the inverse of this layer to recompute the hidden state H. Now, you do another forward pass only of this layer, feeding this H into the last final layer and compute the output. Only this time when you do this, you do track um, the computations. Uh, so you set tracking equal to true. And now you use the automatic differentiation library, uh, for example, in PyTorch or TensorFlow to compute all the gradients within that layer and the gradient of that hidden state. Um, so here again, you do not have to store all the hidden states in the forward pass, but then in the inverse pass, you have this additional forward evaluation in which you do the tracking only for this layer to set all the ver uh, gradients. And then once you recompute these things, then you basically untrack again, or you disconnect your computational graph, and then you go to the next layer. So you only ever do the tracking layer by layer, so it's uh, still memory efficient, but you have to do this extra forward evaluation, which in principle, you don't have to do. But there's also a third option to train an invertible neural network, and our framework is, to our knowledge, the first one that fully takes advantage of the invertibility of these neural networks. So the forward pass is the same as in the last example. You do not track any of your variables, and you compute your output y and your delta residual delta y. But now in the backward pass, you do not do that additional forward evaluation, because you only, first of all, you recompute the input into the respective layer, so you uh, compute the inverse of this layer for input y and recompute this hidden state h bar. And then in the backward pass, we provide our own implementation of the backward pass, which takes as an input argument this original uh, hidden state h and the data residual. And these two quantities are enough to recompute the derivatives of all the weights within this layer and also to compute the uh, data residual of this hidden state. Um, so what the reason why why in PyTorch you can't do that is because your gradient function does not take this original hidden state as an input argument. You can only provide the delta data residual because that hidden state is uh, stored in the computational graph when you track during the forward pass. Um, but if you're actually allowed to input this layer, then you can use this recomputed variable to compute all the necessary quantities, and you do not have to do that additional forward pass.
So our framework, which is called Invertible Networks.jl and implemented in the Julia language, is the first network to our knowledge that takes advantage of this type of architecture. Uh, and it provides common building blocks for invertible neural networks from the literature uh, and also enables uh, training via the change of variables formula. And it provides forward and adjoint Jacobians to do both forward and backward differentiation. So you can find our package repository on GitHub and our package is released under MIT license and you can find the repository if you follow uh, the link that is shown here. Our package consists of four main components uh, and the first component is a set of invertible layers uh, from the literature such as affine coupling layers or one by one convolutions. And each of these invertible layers has a set of functionalities associated with it so you can do a forward pass uh, you can do an inverse pass to recompute the uh, original input from the output. And then in contrast to other invertible neural network frameworks, we also provide for each of these layers manually implemented gradients for the backward pass. And the reason we have manual implementations is because our manual backward pass also takes the original output Y as an input argument and does in a single go an inverse layer plus computation of all the gradients uh, within the layer and with respect to the input. Then the second component of our uh, framework is a set of invertible neural networks, each of which are made up of uh, several of these layers on the left-hand side here. So these are uh, some conventional networks from the literature, such as GLOW or uh, IRAM. Uh, and again, similar to the layers, each of these networks uh, can be evaluated in the forward direction, in the inverse direction, and then you can also do a one a single backward pass that does both the computation of all the gradients and the inverse pass uh, to recompute the, the input state from the output state Y. Uh, then the third component is a set of utilities that con uh, contains activation functions, wavelet transforms, and some other things that you conventionally need for invertible neural networks. And then we also provide a set of examples for generative modeling, uh, as well as some domain-specific examples for, for example, seismic imaging, uh, image segmentation or loop enrolling. And some of the examples I will present later in the talk. So to give you a very general idea of how these invertible layers are implemented, we'll look at one of these layers, uh, the activation normalization. So each layer is implemented as a mutable Julia structure whose only attributes are basically the parameters of that layer. In this case, it's S and B. Uh, and then some flags, for example, whether you want to compute the log dead. And then each of these layers has a, a set of functions associated with it, namely the forward and inverse functions that compute forward and back inverse pass, and then the manual implementations of the backpropagation or backward pass, which, uh, like I said before, in contrast to, say, PyTorch uh, or TensorFlow, also allows you to input the original output Y and then uses that to, in a single pass, recompute the input X, use X to and delta Y to recompute all the gradients uh, and delta x. And then also each layer has an implementation of the forward and adjoint Jacobian, the forward Jacobian being uh, essentially the sensitivity of this layer with respect to either the output or the weights, and the adjoint Jacobian is really just a conventional backward pass. So the reason why you cannot implement optimally memory efficient invertible neural networks uh, on top of PyTorch or TensorFlow is because of their uh, autograd functionality. Uh, because in PyTorch, for example, with Autograd, your function can only compute gradients if you do the tracking. And your backward function either allows no input arguments, for example, for scalars, or a single vector uh, as input arguments. But you cannot input the uh, original output to recompute the hidden state uh, when you set compute all these gradients. Uh, because the hidden states are always tracked by Autograd, and there's no way to hack or change this function, at least not easily. So that's why in uh, invertible neural network frameworks on top of PyTorch or TensorFlow have this hacky wise, uh, layer wise eight automatic differentiation where you first root compute the input using your inverse layer and then you have to do a single forward pass for that layer with tracking enabled to compute all the gradients and then you repeat that for each individual layer. So with our framework in contrast to that, um, we actually take advantage of the invertibility. So each backward layer that is implemented for uh, an invertible layer takes as an input the data residual delta y and the original output y. And the first thing that happens every time is first of all you recompute the original input or hidden state x from the uh, output y. And then you compute the gradients uh, of that respective layer using the data residual, 
and the recomputed input x. Uh, but as you see, because we manually recompute this quantity and then feed it into here, we don't have to do this additional step of having an additional forward evaluation with tracking, uh, which is necessary if you implement your framework on top of TensorFlow of PyTorch. So one of the main design principles of our framework is that it should seamlessly integrate with the existing Julia infrastructure and take advantage of other machine learning packages such as Flux. So when you build these invertible coupling layers, uh, one of the main components is actually just a conventional neural network, uh, Phi here. So uh, here we take advantage of Flux and you can actually build this neural network uh, with Flux. So here in the code, for example, uh, you built a conventional flux model using a couple of um, convolutional layers and batch norm, and now you build an invertible coupling layer out of this flux network. Uh, so you pass that to these uh, building functions that we provide in invertible neural networks, and that turns a flux neural network into one of these invertible layers. So now for this layer, you can evaluate it in the forward direction, but then also in the inverse direction, uh, and you can also compute gradients for it. The second example of where we take advantage of flux is for the optimization. So our framework only provides the set of invertible layers and networks and some uh, helper functions, but it doesn't provide any optimization functionality, which is all uh, borrowed from Flux. So for example, here we define an invertible glow network uh, with some input, and then we have our loss function in which we first compute the forward pass, then we compute the data residual, and then we do the backward pass in which we compute all the gradients. Um, and now if I want to train this network, I'm just using the conventional flux optimization package. So I can uh, set up a solver. Uh, I can retrieve all the parameters of my invertible neural network. And then I can use the flux update function uh, to update the weights of this network uh, for this given optimization algorithm. Another package that we take advantage of to make it easier to combine multiple invertible neural network layers or to combine them with flux layers is uh, chain rules. So in principle, in our package, you have to manually uh, define both the forward and the backward pass because we manually compute our gradients. So if you define a network that com consists of multiple layers, you have to, for the backward pass, call these layers in reverse order. But with chain rules, we can simplify this whole process. Uh, so if you define a uh, reverse mode AD rule for our uh, invertible neural network, uh, so here we create a pullback that is basically built on top of our backward function that takes these two input variables. So now with these uh, chain rule defined, we can create uh, both invertible neural network layers or conventional flux layers and then chain them together and then compute the gradient and loss just as any conventional flux network. Um, and then finally, since we implement all our uh, backward passes and gradients manually, it's of course very important that you make sure that all your implementations are correct. Uh, so for all the layers and networks that we have, we have a very uh, rigorous set of unit tests. So for any type of linear operator, for example, one by one convolutions, we do the adjoint test, which uh, tests that your forward and backward or backward implementation of your linear operator are in fact a correct adjoint pair. And then we also have a gradient test for all linear and nonlinear layers in which you make sure that the gradient actually gives you that second order convergence. Uh, and we check that for all the implementations of the layers that we have. So now in the second half of the talk, I'll show a range of examples that we have implemented with our framework. Uh, and these are examples from inverse problems, from image segmentation, and also from normalizing flows and Bayesian inference. Uh, most of these examples are reproducible and you can find them at this link here. So we'll start with a scenario from inverse problems uh, in which we want to estimate um, or reconstruct uh, an image X from data. So one possible approach would be what's called the post-processing or uh, learned denoiser, in which we first estimate a noisy version of our image and then use a neural network to learn uh, it basically a denoiser that maps this noisy image to a clean version of our image. The second approach would be where uh, we want to use a data-driven approach to learn a mapping from the data domain to the uh, image domain, where our data is given by a linear model, and then we want to go directly from our data uh, to the estimated image. And you could either have a fully data-driven approach, where you have a neural network that maps you from D to X, or you can have what's called a physics augmented or uh, some type of iterative process in which where we both learn a data-driven approach, but we also uh, use the knowledge of our uh, linear operator, J. So if we want to 
go for this physics driven uh, neural network approach, one of the main techniques is uh, what's called loop unrolled uh, inverse problems or loop unrolled neural networks. So in this problem structure, we have a very specific network uh, G, which not only takes our input data as uh, an input argument, but also a linear operator J, where, which is where the knowledge of the physics comes in, because this is the J that uh, generates the data. Um, and then when we look at the structure of this neural network G, this is a very specific network that is essentially a loop unrolled optimization algorithm. So you have a loop in which you first of all compute a conventional uh, gradient using, using the, both the data and the input, and then you pass that gradient through a couple of neural network layers uh, and then update your image, and you repeat that for a number of iterations. So here you basically train this all in one go. Um, and we implemented this for a specific architecture that's called the Invertible Recurrent Inference Machine, or IRAM. Uh, so here we have uh, an example from a seismic imaging where we have a true image. Uh, here we have what the image that you get if you just do conventional gradient descent giving noisy uh, input data D. And here's what the network outputs after a couple epochs of training uh, using this IRAM architecture. And if we look how we implement this in uh, our framework, um, the, the, so first of all, you uh, set up your network. And then when you do the forward pass, like I mentioned here, you not only input your data, but you can also input a linear operator. And this linear operator does not have to be a dense matrix. It can, in fact, be a very complicated operator uh, that is not dense. Um, but the only thing that you need to provide if you provide these matrix v linear operators are essentially implementations of the forward and adjoint actions so that you compute matrix vector and adjoint matrix vector product. And in this example, RJ is actually a seismic modeling operator or code that for both forward and adjoint uh, computations calls some underlying propagator uh, that's implemented in C. For a second example, we'll consider a 4D image segmentation problem. Uh, so in this example, we have two very large scale uh, 3D input volumes, which are uh, hyperspectral land use data. And the goal is uh, to do an image segmentation using both these cubes at two different times as input data uh, to do a, a segmentation or a labeling. Uh, and the network that we use for this example is a invertible neural network that's made up of hyperbolic layers, which are also invertible. Uh, and our network for this specific example is made up of 18 layers uh, using 3D convolutions since we are working on uh, multiple 3D image cubes. So the goal here is to predict uh, a 3D map of the land use change, but we're only giving a partial labeling of the data. Um, for, so in each class, there's only 30 point, 35 point annotations, uh, but we want to estimate the land use uh, difference in the entire volume. So by implementing this network that I mentioned in the previous slide with invertible neural networks, uh, we actually get away with a memory use of 17 gigabyte versus if you had implemented the same or an equivalent network as a conventional neural network uh, in which you use uh, tracking and backpropagation, you would require over 300 gigabytes of memory. So here, the use of invertible neural networks actually enables us to work on a larger model uh, with a very large input volume to bring down that memory factor to a reasonable amount that fits into your GPU. Next, we have a similar example in which we do weekly supervised as image segmentation. So the goal of this example is that we want to map out geological aquifers from a range of multimodal geophysical data. Uh, so here we have different data sources such as magnetic data, topography, gravity, uh, or rock age. Uh, and from all these input data, we want to predict um, a map of geological aquifers. And again, similar to the previous example, we're only given uh, partial labels. So we only have a few point labels of one of the classes. We don't have any labels of the other class. The only thing that we know about the other class is that it occupies roughly 50 to 65% of the domain. So the goal is uh, to do this prediction now, giving only partial labels and this prior information. And the input data, again, is very large. Uh, here we have multiple uh, 56 channels of a large-scale 2D input. So the approach that we're taking in this example to solve a problem is to translate the partial labels that we're given, as well as the prior information that we have, into a set of convex constraints. And these constraints are going to be enforced on the output of the network uh, and not on the weights of the network. So we have our network, which takes 
as an input argument the input data as well as the weights of this network and then outputs uh, the prediction of these aquifiers and we want to enforce that the output of this network satisfies a set of convex constraints so essentially now our training corresponds to solving a non-convex feasibility problem uh, in which we want to find a set of weights k such that the output of this network lies in the intersection of a set of convex constraints and the way we solve this is via projection-based point set to distance functions uh, and if you want to read some more details about how this works um, for this specific example i refer you to uh, the full um, paper up here in the corner so at a high, very high level, what happens is that we have a projection function at PD, which projects the output of our network onto the intersection of convex sets that we want to satisfy. And the goal is to find a set of network parameters K, such that we minimize the distance between our network output and this, uh, the point where our network satisfies all these constraints by being projected onto it. Um, and since we cannot solve this problem directly, what we do is um, we only use the network output y in our objective function and then add the network as a constraint. So here we take our invertible neural network and each layer of our invertible neural network is added as one separate constraint. And then when you want to solve this, we convert it back into an unconstrained problem by forming the Lagrangian. And then you can for, um, perform conventional backpropagation uh, to solve this minimization problem uh, and train your network. So really, essentially, what happens is instead of computing the gradient of your loss function, here you compute the gradient of this distance function uh, plus the network as a constraint. And here at the bottom, we see what our prediction looked like after training this for a few epochs. So on the left-hand side, again, we have our partial labels. Uh, and then here we have the prediction. And on the right-hand side, we have the difference. The final example that we'll look at is an example from normalizing flows and Bayesian inference, uh, specifically for inverse problems. So here the goal is to uh, estimate some image quantity x given data y. And how you do this is you train this change of variables formula that uses a conditional invertible neural network. So in this case, we're, uh, for training, we're giving data y and x, and we'll learn a mapping that maps this data uh, to a different uh, distribution such as a Gaussian. Uh, and then now when you want to do inference, where you're only given y, but you don't know x, but you want to estimate x and you want to estimate the uncertainty of x, uh, what you do is you take your y and you compute your zy. Now you fix your zy and you draw, draw different realizations of zx, which then uh, your network allows you to compute different realizations of, uh, of x. So here's an example of way we have trained this for uh, seismic data reconstruction. So at the top left here, we have the fully sampled data that we want to reconstruct. But after training, we're only given a subsampled version of this data. Uh, so now if we feed this subsampled data into a trained network, and then by drawing different realizations of this random variable, we can get uh, different realizations of the computed output, uh, which you can see in these four figures here. Uh, and because these are very cheap com uh, to compute, we can get many different realizations and then compute uh, both the conditional mean and the standard deviations of this. Then a second example here is from uh, seismic imaging. So in this case, again, we're giving a high fidelity image X uh, and low fidelity images Y during training. And after training, we're only given low fidelity images and we want to estimate these high fidelity images. So we feed this Y into our network and again, draw different realizations of the random seed uh, to get different um, realizations of our seismic image. And once again, uh, we can draw many of those and then compute the conditional mean, uh, as well as the point where it's standard deviation, which is a very effective way of doing uncertainty quantification uh, in this example. So to quickly summarize, we introduce a framework for invertible neural networks and normalizing flows in Julia, uh, which provides memory efficient training, which is completely stateless, so you do not have to store any of the activations. But in comparison to some other comparable frameworks, you also do not have to have any forward extra evaluations during training. Uh, the package integrates seamlessly with the rest of the uh, Julia ecosystem. And the last point that I want to make is that really the way Julia is built made it possible for us to come up with this kind of innovation. When we try to do similar things in Python with PyTorch or TensorFlow, these packages are just not hackable in the same way that Julia and Flux and Chain Worlds are. They can put all these different components together and come up with these innovations. Uh, so really Julia enabled us to, to do this, which is great.
Um, and then, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thanks to Georgia Research Alliance and all the partners of our MLFS Seismic Consortium. And uh, thanks for watching our talk.